we're in business, I hope. All right. It's Tim Vanderwall at the Fraser Basin Council. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today and uh, being patient with our technical issues. Uh, our topic today is assessing climate risk uh, for BC's highway infrastructure. Um, and this is part of our uh, series that we're doing as part of the BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative. Um, so um, for those of you that haven't uh, been part of past webinars, um, this is part of our efforts to support local governments and First Nations and industry and others in BC in preparing for climate change um, through the Regional Adaptation Collaborative Program. And um, as you're probably aware, there is a, a website called retooling.ca that offers a lot of uh, resources and tools where we try and uh, collect information that's that's useful for many. And, um, and one of our uh, offerings are webinars on topics of interest to uh, various folks in BC, in uh, both in, in government, local government, uh, consulting, and uh, the natural resource sectors. Um, so we're very pleased today. Um, sorry, and I should also mention that uh, this work is supported financially by uh, Natural Resources Canada through the Adaptation Platform uh, Program and also in collaboration with the BC Ministry of Environment. Um, so our speaker today, we're very uh, fortunate to have Dirk Nyland, who's the Chief Engineer with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, he's been with uh, the Ministry uh, and working in this area for uh, over 40 years, uh, and since 2001 has been the Chief Engineer. Um, and, and in uh, 2013, Dirk was awarded uh, the Queen Elizabeth uh, Diamond Jubilee Medal for his service. So. Um, we're going to hear a bit about um, his work to explore climate change risk assessments uh, for different regions in BC, um, for BC highways, and to provide some specific uh, case study examples. So uh, before you get started, Dirk, I'm just going to switch over to your presentation. So you'll move the slides along for me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, just hold on here. Having some other issue. Okay, so just hold on. We've uh, another uh, glitch here. We will just uh, just stand by, and we'll uh, try and get that resolved. Okay. Okay, we should be. I see the presentation. Okay, great. All right, Dirk, um, over to you. Okay, we go to the first slide. So the ministry's motivation started uh, back in 2007. I was asked to sit on, on a group that was developing a protocol for checking climate change vulnerability, and, we, and we've been working at it ever since then. We've applied the uh, the, the protocol to a few sites within the province to see what our vulnerabilities might be. And of course, we have our motivation for that is to make sure that we understand the character, rate, and change of climate in extreme weather events. Climate change in and of itself is, you know, when you talk about it, it, it it's by a degree here, a degree there, that's, that's sort of thing. But it's the impact of climate change on extreme events. And when you're designing engineering infrastructure, it's designed to, ha to handle extreme events or extreme events to a, a what you call a um, design event. Uh, so if those start getting exceeded because of climate change, then of course we've got some issues. Um, so how can engineering keep, keep pace and continue to design infrastructure that's resilient and effective was one of the questions that we wanted to answer. We want to know what the potential impact would be on the way we currently design, operate, and, and maintain our infrastructure, and to adapt those practices to make sure we end up with a resilient transportation system. Next slide. Uh, we obviously want to impact the or minimize the impact on on, on public infrastructure. Um, we're in order to deal with that, we need to know what the capacity of the infrastructure is to re responding uh, to, to, to changing climates. Um, 
things were designed over a period of time. If, if most of you are, will be familiar with our highway system, and it's you know it's formed of components that were designed some as early as 1950, 1960, and some as late as last year. Uh, so there, there's different philosophies and different things built in, into those designs. The challenge is to make sure that we understand where the vulnerabilities are for those things and how to make sure that we, we keep moving along uh, as best we can for the future. Uh, next slide. So um, what we've been using is the PIVC vulnerability analysis, and please don't ask me what PIVC stands for because I forget. It's Public Infrastructure Environmental Vulnerability Committee, I believe is what it stands for. Uh, we've been working with them. We've applied the the protocol. Um, it, it 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 deals with extreme events. It looks at the vulnerability through a uh, fairly um, general uh, analysis. Uh, you can get into, into some really deep down dirty engineering analysis, but initially you, 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 t you take a higher uh, look at it. And we use that for, for managing and planning and engineering design operations. Next slide. So it's a five-step process. Step one is is, is determining where you want to apply this stuff. So think about the site that you want to look at. Uh, you have to get as much information about that site uh, as you can, both from a climate perspective, uh, from a use perspective, from a design perspective, and from a perspective of what sort of maintenance issues have you had and under what conditions. You begin to pull all that inf information together in step three, and you begin to look at it um, from the point of view of the various components of the uh, site that you're looking at, whether it be bridges or components within the bridges or roads or ditches next to the roads, those sorts of components. And you begin to answer a set of questions, which, which we'll get into in a sec here. And then at the end, you come out with some uh, recommend recommendations and conclusions. The step four in there is if you want to look at some things in detail, uh, one of the issues we had uh, back in, in 2012 was, was Pine Pass. We wanted to know in detail from a hydrological perspective why we lost lost bridges and, and why in some instances the streams went around where the bridges were. When you start thinking about when that was designed, there was, that, that gave us some of our answers, but, but some of the other answers needed to come from the climate stuff as well. Next slide. When you do one of these vulnerability analysis, we generally do it in a, in a workshop format, and it generally takes a couple of days to do it at minimum. There's a lot of work needs to be done up front and, and some work afterwards. We usually try to get a facilitator to keep things moving along. Uh, but what you do if, if for people that attend those workshops is you have the designers, the operators, the managers, anybody that's involved with with that. For our, our very first one we did on, on the Coquihalla, we actually brought back in some of our retired folks, some of our uh, district uh, uh, operations folks, and then some of the, the maintenance folks that had experience with the infrastructure from a practical point of view, uh, not necessarily from a design point of view. And, as, as a design engineer, things are, here's what we're going to design for. But Mother Nature has a habit of throwing different things at you, and it's the maintenance guys and the, operation, the operational guys that have to deal with that. So they become very important in one of these things. You also want to make sure you have a climate specialist on board so you can begin to talk about climate models, uh, what they're good for, uh, what their downsides are, which ones are being used, how they apply to the area. Um, and then get some of that background information. You also need to have the broad knowledge of the infrastructure, which I've already discussed. And the discussion that you have brings out different perspectives of, of, of what's, what's a vulnerability. From an engineering perspective, the vulnerability might be, well, are, are our culverts big enough? From an operational perspective, it might be, gee, can we keep the trash from plugging up the culvert? So you, you need that full perspective to look look at what your vulnerabilities really are. Next slide. 
sorts of components that we look at from a transportation perspective are, are the larger things like the bridges, the culverts, protective works, that, that sort of thing. Within, uh, say, a bridge, a bridge can be a fairly complex structure, so there are things in there that extreme temperatures can uh, affect and extreme rainfall can, can uh, affect. But most of the things we ended up looking at, particularly after we've done four or five of these studies, is our drainage appliances. Because what it's, what it's turning out to be is it's the water and how much water were, did we design to handle and how much water are we actually getting. So that's, that's, that's where our major vulnerability is. Moving along. Next slide. So the sorts of things that we begin to look at in the climate risk parameters are our temperatures, you know, say, how many days over, over 30 degrees, and we seem to be getting a few few more days than normal over 30 degrees right now. And we can see there, there's been some issues. Uh, what sort of temperature variabilities? Free thaw cycles are uh, not something that's kind to road systems, so you want to know about that sort of thing. Extreme rainfall, and when you're talking about extreme rainfall, you need to define over what period. You know, are, you, are, you, are you looking at extreme rainfall in 24 hours? Extreme rainfall over two or three days, that sort of thing. And what what are the potential sources of, of some of these extreme rainfalls? And of course, for, for BC, for the West Coast, it's it's the atmospheric rivers, the Pineapple Expresses, that tend to drop 30 to 40 to 50 percent of, of the moisture on the coast in a, a relatively short period of time that can cause issues. Next slide. So oh, this is just an example of what a atmospheric river looks like. This is the one that hit, hit Bella Coola, I think, in, 19, in 20, um, 10 or 11. But you see there's, there's, a, there's a blue, almost looks like a fire hose pointed directly at, at the coast of BC. And that's, that's essentially an atmospheric river. They, they affect most of the, the uh, in one form or another, the, the coast of, of, of North America. You get them in other parts, parts of the world as well. Next slide. So this slide shows you the uh, areas that we've looked at and where we carried on, on some studies. So we started out with looking at the Coquihalla as our first cruise using the, the, the vulnerability analysis just to see what, what our vulnerabilities were there. Uh, we also picked the Coquihalla because it's a major road. It, 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 it straddles two climate regimes, but it's also one of the projects that we have lots of information on because it's, 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 it hasn't been around that long. Uh, with what we learned from, from it, we then looked at a piece of highway that was designed uh, longer ago uh, and in a slightly different climate regime. So we went up and, and looked at Highway 16 between Burns Lake and Vanderhoof and checked out to see what the, what the issues were. And a lot of issues were similar, uh, except that the design philosophies used on the Yellowhead were somewhat different from the design philosophies used in, in the Coke, which meant that the uh, design flows for the Yellowhead weren't quite as, as, as well thought out as the ones for the Coquihalla. And that turned out to be the vulnerability there. Then we had the uh, three, three years running where we had major closures and major washouts in Bella Coola and Stewart and, and in Pine Pass. And we want to look at it from the point of view of if we'd done the vulnerability analysis, would we have picked out the vulnerabilities that were there or are there still things we need to add to the vulnerability uh, uh, protocol to make sure that we ha have it all covered? Um, we did this work as, as as part of an, an, an NRCAN project, they funded some of it. We, we had uh, other folks involved in it as well, including PKIC out of, out of UVIC to help us with the climatology part of it. Um, we concluded that, yeah, we probably would have picked up most of the vulnerabilities, except for the vulnerabilities related to vintage design. So when I say vintage design, that's design philosophies that were followed in the 60s and 70s. Uh, which aren't necessarily the same as they are today. Somebody pointed out to me the other day, one of the major changes between our, our way of looking at hydrology in, in that era was that a lot of things we looked at were snowpack driven. 
snow snow melt driven. What we're getting into today aren't necessarily snowpack melt driven issues, but just straight rain issues. When we look at the Pine Pass issue, that happened in the middle of the summer, and that was just a heavy duty rainstorm, an extreme rainstorm that came in on a on a weather pattern that was different from what we normally see. Uh, that causes a lot of problems. So we learned some lessons there, obviously from an engineering point of view, and from what to look for going forward. Uh, next slide. So these are the examples we looked at. The Bella Coola, it cost us $45 million to deal with that. Stewart was, was $7 million to uh, respond and another $11 million to repair. We lost a bridge there that we had to fix. And then the Pine Pass, which was by far our, our, our most expensive uh, failures there. That was about $70 million to get all that fixed up again. Um, one thing we found there was it's not just us we need to worry about when these things happen. There's a major pipeline that runs close to the highway and the pipeline itself was affected. And uh, the pipeline had to be dealt with first before we could deal, deal with the uh, with highway stuff. The other thing we noted is that we couldn't put things back the way they were because of the extreme um, um, weather and, and drainage issues that we had there. There was a significant amount of, of uh, bed load movement. And we couldn't, we couldn't essentially replace structures that we lost with a, with a similar design because the bed loads had changed and, and the, the creeks had changed and the amount of, of potential uh, water coming out of a particular drainage had changed. Um, so things like that need to be taken into consideration. We did develop a vulnerability analysis for future uh, extremes for some of these sites to make sure that what was being planned as repair work and as replacement work would stand the test of time. And we looked at that from a, a climate change adaptation and vulnerability analysis point of view. Okay, next slide. This is an example of um, looking forward. When you're beginning to think about how to design something that's supposed to last 30 or 40 or 50 or even 100 years into the future, um, what sort of sorts of numbers can you expect to use and how, how can you deal with those? What this illustrates is um, not essentially using uh, uh, actual data for the, for the uh, 1971 to 2000 part, but using the data that a um, climate model or a set of climate models uh, um, generated and then having that same climate model look 50 years hence and see what it generates for there and then look at the percent change to give you an idea what sorts of percent change you might expect both in the annual pre precipitation and say in the 25, uh, 25 year, 24 hour type of, 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 of event. And you'll see that for, for the most part, for the ones we looked at, uh, it's not going to get any easier. We're going to get much more precipitation because the percent changes are, are quite high. But these are the sorts of things that you need to begin to do to get your design teams working both from the engineering perspective, from the hydraulic perspective, and from the, uh, the climate perspective. And you need, at, at minimum, all three of those, those groups to come together and have a common understanding of what you're trying to do. Next slide. This is a, another example of a, uh, a change that we're expecting to see uh, 50 years hence. This, this is looking at, at Bella Coola. Uh, right down almost the center of the picture is, is sort of the uh, spine of, of, of the mountain range in there. The stuff to the west of the mountain range towards Bella Coola, there's not going to be that much change in, in overall precipitation because it rains pretty heavily there already. Where you'll see the changes on the other side of, of the, uh, the mountain on the east side and the plateau where you're beginning to see some significant changes and probably changes that could potentially overwhelm uh, whatever the, the uh, drainage appliances for that for the roads in, in that area were designed for. So it's it's um, it, it's it's not a one size fits all. You really have to look at each each uh, 
ecological or climatological area within the province to see how how it could potentially be affected. And again, that's where you need your climatologist. Next slide. Well, we can quickly skip through this one. This is what what, what happens with one of these hydrographs that that you get for a stream. You can see the the black line is is the uh, um, what we normally expect from looking back in history. Um, the, the shaded parts is where it's anticipated to go going forward with uh, more precipitation. Next slide. So this is when you get down to beginning the, the analysis. Down the left side, this is essentially step three of the vulnerability analysis. Down the left side, you've got all the uh, components involved, or at least the components that folks felt were, were important to that particular piece of infrastructure. Along the top, you'll see there's a whole number of, of, of climate events or meteorological events, uh, everything from, from um, uh, look at some of them, you know, annual rainfall, extreme rainfall, all, all those sorts of things. And what you do when you do one of these vulnerability analysis very briefly is you start to look at the component, you look at the, at the weather thing and you say, you answer a series of yes, no questions. Are our shoulders affected by heavy rain? Yes. Are our shoulders affected by average normal rain? No. So you start getting a whole bunch of yes, no's. You obviously filter down to all the ones that you answer yes on and then you begin to look at the probability of, of of something happening and the severity of, of, of what that would be. So you start looking at, say, your culverts, and yes, culverts are affected by, by um, extreme precipitation. What's the probability of that pre extreme precipitation happening? Well, if you're in the terrace area or the Bella Coola area or in the house sound area, the, 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 the probability might be quite high. They give it a fairly large number, say a five or a six. What's the, what's the severity if you lose a culvert. Uh, you know, can, can we afford to have Highway 99 to Whistler cut by a culvert that, that was overwhelmed during a heavy rainstorm? The answer to that is probably no, that's not, not a desirable thing to happen. So you give it a high severity number. Severity number. You go through the same sort of thinking on, on each of the components for each of the wetter things and you come out with something that looks like this. And what you start to concentrate on are the things that end up in, 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 in pink, which are greater than 35 for the most part. Uh, those are probably your, your high, pr high priority issues. The ones in yellow, which is generally between 12 and, and 35, are the things yeah, that could be a problem, but they haven't been a problem yet, but they bear closer looking at. And then the ones less than, than 12 are probably not issues that you need to worry about right away. So you begin to get a snapshot fairly quickly without necessarily doing a whole lot of, of intense analysis work of where your vulnerabilities are. And, and you can begin to respond to that. The uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just looking at the 200 year flow for a, uh, a couple of creeks again, going back to Stewart, Bella Coola, and, and Pine Pass, and the average change that took place uh, and, and that you can expect to take place going forward, and maybe even looking out further. Um, this is to illustrate that if you're going to go out and look further than the 25 to 50 years that you can get right now, Funny things may happen, and those funny things uh, may be due to something in the models. And you do really need your climatologists that understand the models to help you work through these things. Because um, as you can see, the, the, the average changes seem to be decreasing going forward, and that may not be exactly what, what, what is actually going to happen. Next slide. So what were our conclusions from the work that we've done is that uh, based on the risk assessments we've carried out that our, our, our transportation system, our highway system is generally fairly resilient to climate change. Where we find we have the greatest vulnerability is in the extreme precipitation events which could over overload our drainage systems. Uh, and that's not necessarily exceeding the capacity so much sometimes as, as uh, the things that happen when heavy rain 
drains hit a, a drainage area, you, you get mud and rock and debris and all sorts of things that come down, and they can block the culvert. And that, of course, a block culvert doesn't pass any water, and therefore you got a problem. Whereas if you could keep the, the culverts unblocked, chances are you, you could pass most of the water without too much trouble. Um, there were some other things that we were interested in, primarily because we were uh, of our work on the coke, and that's things like wind and fog. Wind uh, ha has, a, has an effect on, on drivers, obviously, has an effect on trucks, but it also has an effect on, on the size of the signs we use on the highway. And with the, with the move to having more and more changeable message signs, those things are, are pretty large and pretty heavy. Uh, what sort of wind loads do they need to be able to withstand? Um, and of course, fog is is an issue from uh, from visibility and safety on the highway. And are we going to get an increase in in foggy days, or is it about going to stay about the same? Similarly, with our avalanches, what's going to happen with our avalanches? Are we going to get fewer avalanches? Or are we going to get avalanches that that are changing in character, say from uh, fewer dry avalanches to more wet avalanches? Um, or maybe in the extreme, we're going to be able to plant banana trees on our avalanche slopes. But right now, the the models can't tell us those sorts of things just yet. But we're working with with PKIC at UVIC and the modelers to ensure that the engineering needs and the infrastructure needs are being taken into consideration when they're doing their climatological work. Um, it's great that they. You know, they do the work uh, on a theory basis, and, and there's, there's certain things that they need to know to keep the science moving. But there's also a number of things that, that we need to know from these models to make sure that we, that we can design a resilient infrastructure going forward. And it's more than just highways. It's, 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 it's buildings. It's you know, HVAC systems. It's what happens with airports and, and, and the ability to run an airport. Um, all those sorts of things are affected, and, and the questions that people that run those sorts of things are beginning to ask are questions that haven't been asked of our climatologists before. Next slide. So design implications uh, is fairly straightforward. When you're going to design something, you, you, you've got to figure out how long it's going to last. Uh, say a, 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 an asphalt lasts 15 to 20 years, so we don't need to be overly concerned. We need to be concerned, but not overly concerned about making sure we understand what climate changes may happen or what extreme weather changes may happen uh, in, in those 10 or 15 or 20 years. When you're talking about culverts, they're there for a lot longer, so you want to be able to understand uh, what sorts of uh, flows they may need to um, uh, uh, handle in, in their lifespans. When it comes to bridges, uh, particularly uh, some of the larger structures, you may need to know what sort of uh, extreme weather uh, phenomena they, they need to go, need to be able to withstand, say, in the next 100 years. A great example of that right now is uh, looking at the George Massey Tunnel replacement. If, if we build a bridge in there, um, there's some pretty heavy-duty windstorms that come through. A 10-lane bridge doesn't exactly, uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a 10-lane bridge and you're dealing with high winds, there's a whole bunch of engineering things you need, need to consider. But if you want to make sure that bridge is still there 100 years from now, you're going to also need to know something about the wind speeds and, and, and the extreme weather that, that that bridge may need to undergo at that time. So that presents certain challenges that uh, are, are silly. It's unclear how, how we're going to get to those answers. We're, we still need to do more work with, with the climatologists. And from an engineering perspective, we need to do a little bit more work in thinking about that. Um, next slide. Part and parcel of doing the, uh, the workshops, uh, not, surpri not, not surprisingly, we discover that we don't all speak the same language. Even though we all speak English, we don't all speak the same language. We had, we had some very interesting uh, arguments early on between what engineers uh, understood to be uh, conservative and what a climatologist understood to be conservative. Uh, what an engineer for this purpose thought probability meant and what a climatologist thought probability meant. So we collected a lot of that 
information and we've published it together. Again, this was part of the NRCAN project. We published a climate language primer so that engineers and operators and managers and climatologists uh, and other scientists could speak the same language or at least had a translation guide to uh, learn what, what the other really meant. And that guide is up on our on our website for, for anybody to, to, to pick off and have a look at. Next slide. So lessons learned. Um, it's still early days, so there's probably going to be a whole lot more lessons learned than, than uh, what we've learned to date. But what, what we've learned to date is that we need to develop an awareness of climate change. Uh, we've been spending, as a ministry, uh, some significant time over the last 12 months working with our consultants, our engineering consultants, making sure that they're aware of, aware of climate change and, and what it means and how to take it into account. Uh, there needs to be um, uh, better understanding within the engineering fraternity so, so that infrastructure can be designed properly. Um, adaptation to climate change has to become part of your organizational culture. People have to think about it, have to think about it and how it affects things. Um, that becomes important. It, it's also very important to use multidisciplinary teams for projects. Uh, we started to get into that, say, 10, 15 years ago when, when the environment was, was top of mind. And it's not unusual for all of our projects these days to have uh, uh, environmental folks involved with it to make sure that the, uh, the things that are being built are, are being built in an environmentally friendly way as far as possible. Um, I think we're going to have to get to the point where those multidisciplinary teams will also need to have climatologists on them to make sure that that part of the uh, equation is covered. You've got to make sure you use qualified professionals and, and if possible, make sure to have local knowledge. But it's still, um, there's still going to be a lot of engineering judgment and engineering judgment is based on, on what's happened in the past and, and what you know about the structure from, a, from an engineering point of view. But also knowing uh, what the area can potentially do from a, a uh, weather and extreme weather event uh, um, perspective. Also need to work towards uh, adaptation education for professionals. Engineer Scanna is working on a syllabus and I think they are pretty close to completion. Um, for universities so that engineers coming through the university system over the next few years will get this, this training and this, this information. Uh, engineers Canada, by the way, is, is the organization that uh, oversees all the professional organizations in each of the provinces, but it also sets the and approves the uh, syllabuses for the um, engineering curriculum at, at most universities. Uh, next slide. Best practices, again, there will probably be more best practices that the more and more we get into this, but some early re results are you've got to make sure you understand the data that, are, that you're using in your codes and standards. As part of the work that PIVC did, there's about 40 or so or more uh, pilot projects that were, that were done in, in various areas. I, I'm the chair for the roads and related structures um, uh, group that, uh, that works on that. And what we did was look at all the transportation related uh, um, studies to, to see if there was a common thread about what's going right, what's going wrong, what, what are people looking at. And what we found very briefly is that by and large the codes and standards and, and, and design processes that are being used are, are sound and, and they're not necessarily an issue. What is an issue is the data, the, the, the climate data that's being used in, in those codes and standards. You know, the, the, the common practice is to use, say, the past 30 year average. Well, the past 30 year average isn't, isn't going to be indicative of the next 30 year average. 
Um, it was even worse in some instances where the uh, climate data that was being used was a 30-year average that was already 20 or 30 years old that, that, that hadn't been weeded out, out, out of a code. So it's that sort of sort of thing. It, 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 it means uh, for, for the professionals that you got to understand the black box that you're, that you're working with. Uh, certainly when I graduated from university, a lot of things were done by first principles. I learned to use a slide rule and how to, how to get that done. Folks coming through universities these days rely on models and, and, and uh, black boxes and, and programs that are all already there. And that's great because it speeds things up and allows you to look at more things. But you've got to understand what the assumptions are and what the data is that's that in those black boxes so you can come to the right conclusions. It's no longer good enough from a legal perspective or, or, or if it even a professional engineering perspective to say, well, I did everything the code told me to do and the thing failed, it's not my fault. Uh, that's not going to cut it anymore. Uh, you have to be aware of, 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 of how that data changes and how to use that data. And that's part of, part of, of, of being an engineer. Um, use quantitative data or professional judgment. What you're going to find from climate models is that um, you can't necessarily get the black and white answers or the hard numbers that you'd be used to getting when you're designing something. It, 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 it's now going to be the climatologist will tell you there's a signal that's going to change. Uh, may change by 5%, may change by 10%, but that's just a signal. So from an engineering perspective, how do you put that into a design to make sure that what you come out with is the, uh, is, is the best possible thing. You'll find yourself using things like sensitivity, sensitivity analyses a, a lot more. And to help out with that, um, BCMOTI has just put out their uh, technical circular requiring engineer consultants working for us and our projects to demonstrate to us how they've taken uh, climate change and engineering adaptation in, into account. Going along with that, APEG BC is developing a practice guide which will be out in by March of next year to help guide professionals because what we what we in the ministry didn't want to do is for each discipline sort of give a heads up, well you got to worry about this, so you don't need to worry about that. That's some of the work that, that uh, APEG is, is undertaking in, in their uh, um, practice guides. You need to understand the risks and uncertainties that the models have in them, as well as the normal risks and uncertainties that, that, that you get in, in the design process. And you've got to look at the lifespan um, of, of what you're doing. And, and I think it's ever more important that you look at the lifespan because the, the uh, uh, extreme events that, that your infrastructure has to undergo in their life going forward uh, hasn't been represented by anything that's happened to date. You may see bits and pieces of it, but it, it, it needs to be thought of as, as, as a changing and moving target, and you've got to make sure that your infrastructure is, is designed to handle that. Uh, you, you can do that by looking at the information that the ensembles for climate model can result, and use the best models to date. And that's, that's all where your, where your climatology folks come in to help you do that. Next slide. So the next steps for us in the ministry is we've put out our, our directive. It's out there now. It came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're getting lots of questions, which, are, which is good. We had a, uh, a, a subcommittee of folks from the consulting from ACECBC help us. There's at least two, two people from each uh, discipline. So we had a group of about 20 folks that helped us pull this thing together. The practice manual guide is, is being written and underway, and like I said, will be available next March. Climate data is available uh, through PKIC, and I'll give you the, uh, the coordinates for that in a minute here. And they've developed something called Plan to Adapt, as well as a number of other uh, really good information about how climate change and extreme events will change for various parts of the province. Because what's going to happen on the coast isn't what's going to happen in the Okanagan, isn't what's going to happen, say, in, in Peace River country. They're, they're all going to be different and, and unique, and you need to think about each one uh, individually. Of course, that leads to requiring a lot of having a lot of training and, and workshops, of which 
that this is why I'm going to get people's heads around what's happening. Next slide. Uh, technical circular is out there, and it, uh, it it's requiring engineering practice based on future climate rather than uh, the past 30 years. Um, we've included in there a uh, design criteria sheet now. That's something we usually use for our geometric design work, but for in this instance, what we've uh, put together is a, a design criteria sheet that uh, will that where you can list how you would have normally um, designed or what, what values you, you would have normally used for a particular component and what value you're going to use going forward because of anticipated uh, extreme events. And there's a, uh, uh, a link there to the uh, technical circular. It, it, it's on our MOTI website. Next slide. Any now? Uh, this is just a, a, a really quick overview of what the uh, what, what's required for for design projects. Con consider obviously consideration of, of climate change, but more than climate change, consideration of, of the extreme weather events and how those extreme weather events are going to change because of climate change. Um, I think that's pretty much all the things I've been talking about all the way along, so I don't know that we need to belabor this slide very much longer. Next slide. This is a, a quick snapshot of what the uh, design criteria, criteria sheet looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like, to, like, looks like today. It'll probably change in the next few months uh, as people begin to get experience with the with this thing, and then it will become a little bit more uh, user friendly than it is now, but we have to start somewhere. We have to get people playing with it and we have to get people using it. We have to get people starting to ask questions and, and suggesting better ways to do it. Next slide. This is the uh, PKIC plan to adapt site and for, I forget exactly how many uh, ecological zones we've got in, in the province. It's something like 10 or 11 or so. For each of those zones, uh, PKIC has uh, information like this, uh, and it begins to give you an idea of how, how climate may change in the area that you're working in. Now, these things only go out, out about 25 years, but it'll begin to give you a good start as to where you think you're going to have issues and where you may not have issues. Also, there's other information on, uh, on, on PKIC's website that, that, that gives you a lot more uh, uh, in-depth information about climate change if you want it. The other companion piece to this is the PICS uh, website. And on the PICS website, there are uh, online tutorials to uh, begin to, to, to teach people a little bit more about climate change and, uh, and how to deal with it and how to read, deal with, with the models. So both are, are, are worthwhile uh, keeping in mind and, and referring to and using. Next slide. Oh, I'm done. Son of a gun. Okay. Uh, what we've got there is a few additional uh, websites that people might find useful. Uh, the first one is our ministry website where all the stuff that we've been doing, we've collected on, on one website for people to use. Uh, the PIVC website has all the case studies on it. It's, it's based out of Ottawa and there's 40 plus uh, case studies on everything from water plants to wastewater plants to uh, building HVAC issues and of course transportation issues. And then the last one is the, uh, is, is the PIX website that has the uh, tutorials on it. So uh, I'm open for questions or however you want to carry on from here. Thanks very much, Dirk. I appreciate the, the detailed presentation. And um, for folks that have questions, the best way to do that is to type your question into the question box. So it, it's difficult for us to unmute the phone lines given the number of people here. Um, and so we'll read out the questions as we go and, um, and uh, Dirk can respond to them. So we've already got a few in the queue. Um, the first one is around um, what is the province doing in terms of prevention, monitoring, and diagnosis of the infrastructure? Uh, prevention, monitoring, and diagnosis of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, the sorts of things I've been talking about, uh, 
coming to grips with what sorts of um, extreme weather events and how those are going to change, uh, making sure that our drainage appliances can handle them or at least plan to upgrade them as necessary, and having a look at how we're operating to make sure that um, conscious of, of, of drainage appliances that, 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 that may get plugged up and cease to work. And, and that's, that's work that happens with our, our uh, maintenance contractors on a, on a daily basis. But it's also something that as we do our rehab projects and of course as we design our new projects, uh, we're putting it in, in, into place. Um, another uh, specific question here is, was uh, 2011 the last serious uh, event that you applied this an analysis to? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, another question, uh, your climate modeling looks at precipitation, temperature, wind, fog, etc. But do you also consider the changes in vegetation that will result? Um. Indirectly, yes. Um, again, that's part of the, the detailed engineering study. So if you're looking at what kind of, uh, you know, how high your bridge has to be, how wide your bridge has to be, how big your culverts have to be, we're expecting the hydrologist to spend a little bit more time thinking about what's in the basin and has the basin, say, suffered a, a forest fire? Uh, has the basin uh, been logged or is it likely to be logged? Um, those sorts of things are taken in, into account in, in that way. Okay, great, thanks, Dirk. Um, uh, my colleague Bob Purdy, who's watching the webinar here with us, also has a question, so I'll, I'll ask him to go ahead. Great, thanks, Jim, and thanks, uh, Dirk, for an excellent presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, this question may be tough to answer, but I'm curious about how you address concerns from lay decision makers who are in charge of budget allocations about the accuracy of the model in particular and or general doubt that climate change and severe weather are clear and present uh, issues? Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, education and, and, and doing things like this and being prepared to go and talk to councils and talk to committees and talk to the people that are doing that sort of stuff and, and, and bring them into change or bring them the information as to how, how what they should be thinking about. From our perspective, it's not so much uh, if it exists. It's pretty easy to go back now and, and look at the weather record over the last little while and say, well, yeah, we've seen more extreme events or that the extreme events have been, have been more extreme than they have been in the past. So something is happening. We know from a, from a, a design perspective that uh, what we see happening probably doesn't fit the profile of the design storm of when those things were designed. So it, it, it almost comes down to a bit of a cost benefit. What, what happens if you lose that infrastructure and how, likely, how much more likely is it that you're going to lose that infrastructure going forward? But that means you've got to sit down with the folks and you've got to give them a little bit of climatology 101 and, and, and give them some of, that, some of that background information. I think that's the stage that we're at. We've sort of done the engineering stuff. We've sort of done and we sort of know where we're going. What really is required now is the education and to get people thinking about it and to get people asking the right questions and having having those discussions so that they do come up with the right answers. Great, thank you. Um, another question here is, um, can you expand on adaptation measures that can help prevent culverts from clogging during extreme events? Uh, for example, is a change in maintenance practice required or a different design? It's, it's a little bit of both. Uh, what we use in some areas are trash racks, which are um, vertical members that, 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 that prevent things from um, plugging it up. Or, um, sometimes it requires uh, maybe making the culverts a little bit bigger, a little bit wider. Uh, it, it, it entails being aware of what sort of bed loads might start to move through those culverts. Um, and in some instances it might been looking at a worst case scenario and seeing if you need to put in some overflow culverts or, or some additional culverts higher up in, say, if, 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 it, if, if it's a, um, an embankment that the culverts are in, to try and deal with the overload uh, without necessarily 
imperiling the road surface. So there's a number of things you can do. Um, one other question here um, is, are there any initiatives to use sensors and instruments for automatic monitoring? And will there be any support for such efforts? Uh, we've looked at that in the past primarily for, for bridges. Um, technology, funnily enough, isn't quite there to give us the instrumentation that we need for the instant response. Um, so far, the, you know, the best things we've got so, uh, are our are, 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 uh, regular maintenance patrols. Uh, we do have some, we, we, we have tried some instrumentation. There is a move afoot to get better uh, and, and, and more complete uh, monitoring of, of stream flows so that you can get um, better warning of what's going on. Um, I think the best thing is, is, is local knowledge. I mean, I spent 20 years working out of, out of Terrace. And I knew that when we were going to get a heavy-duty rainstorm um, that was going to last for 24 to 48 hours, I sort of knew where where I could expect mud flows to happen. So you could put the maintenance contractor on on notice that hey, things may happen. Look at the creeks if they're if they're running dirty, uh, and then you may want to be a, a little bit more careful about what's going to happen there. So it's, it's a combination of things. Okay, great. Um, one of the things we're always interested in, uh, we'll just take a break from questions for a minute, is um, the kind of topics that people are interested in for future webinars. So we're just going to do a quick poll here. I appreciate your feedback. Uh, so um, it'll come up on the screen and just click on what uh, topics you might be interested in hearing about in the future. Okay, why don't we put it up now? It looks like people have mostly uh, clicked on the link. Yeah. And you can see uh, kind of interest. So we've got uh, a whole variety of topics here. Obviously, not surprising with the folks on the line here today. Lots of interest in the infrastructure is maybe the top next topic, but also industry adaptation for forestry, mining, energy, and agriculture. Uh, but lots of interest in all the topics overall. Uh, any other questions here before we uh, wrap things up? We've got one more. Um, I'm having trouble seeing. Oh, we've got a few now. Um, are the current precipitation intensity duration frequency adequate for design, and have you noticed greater impacts from short-term intense precipitation events that are not captured by our current IDF climate guidelines? Uh, no and yes. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a move afoot and we, we are looking at upgrading the IDF curves. Uh, we're, we've got something uh, in the works with, with PKIC to, to help us do that. Um, I think individual, I, I'm, I don't do that, you know, I'm not a hydrologist, I'm, I'm really a, a geological engineer. <laughs> uh, so I can't say exactly whether the technical detail on that, but I, I do know they're they're not adequate for what we're doing, um, and we are in the process of of making sure there's a there's a way to get them upgraded. Okay, and we've got one um, more of a suggestion here than a question, which is that vegetation changes um, should best have an arborist involved to recognize potential bank stability loss from forest cover changes beyond insects, fire, flood events. Yeah, and generally, when I talk about the environmentalists on our project teams, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a mix of folks that, you know, we have arborists, we have people that deal with, with bugs, we have people that deal with fish, uh, animals, that sort of thing. A lot of the work on vegetation is being done through Flinro. Um, so we, 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 and essentially, with, with PKIC, there is a project advisory committee that I sit on, and we, we have reps from Flinro on that reps from hydro on, on that. So there is um, sort of an interchange of what, what each of us is doing and how what each of us is doing works together. I've, I've sat down and, and, and run a, a vulnerability workshop with uh, Flynn Rowe on, on one or two forest 
roads that they were interested in learning more about. And the, the vegetation stuff did come up in that as well. Okay, well, I think uh, we're coming up to 12 o'clock, and so uh, we're going to wrap things up here. First, uh, thanks very much, Dirk, for your presentation. And um, I, I learned a lot about uh, what's been happening, and I think it has uh, value for other sectors and other uh, folks looking at infrastructure around British Columbia. Um, you, there will be a survey that you'll receive uh, after the webinar, uh, so we really do appreciate your feedback on how things have gone and how we can improve. Um, and um, the presentation uh, should be online on our website at retooling.ca, hopefully in the next week or so, uh, in case you've missed it or if there's something you'd like to review. Uh, and we try and keep uh, a number of our past webinars there, and so there may be other topics that you're interested in learning about, um, so please check it out. So uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for your participation today and the great questions. Uh, great discussion after the presentation. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much.